Thank you all so much for being here tonight. I'm Joel Brumeyer. I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance for the Great Lakes. Uh, I'll talk very briefly, uh, briefly a little more about myself in a minute. Um, I know that uh, we are all here uh, for a couple of reasons, I think. One is to hear a, a deep discussion of this incredible source of fresh water that we have right here in our backyard. Um, and another is to really understand the power of deep journalism and patient journalism and how important that is, uh, particularly now in, in the world that we live in. Um, we're also gathering at a time of some very unusual circumstances, and I'd like to just ask that we take a moment um, to recognize that we're, we're in a period of um, both some, some horrific violence and some unprecedented um, uh, disasters that are facing our country right now. So if you wouldn't mind, please just take in a moment of silence uh, with me to think of our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico and in Las Vegas and in other places affected um, by, these, by these events. Okay, thank you all so much um, for taking that time and again for being here tonight. Uh, the first thing I'd like to do is to thank our wonderful hosts at the Metropolitan Planning Council and give them a round of applause for this setup. Thank you. Um, I know uh, some of you came here because you're connected to the Alliance, some because you're connected to MPC, and hopefully some of you just saw this on social media and things work the way that they're supposed to. So uh, MPC, though, for those of you who, who, who do not know, is an 83-year-old urban planning and policy nonprofit dedicated to shaping a more equitable, sustainable, and prosperous greater Chicago region. Uh, among their efforts that include the environment, they have a robust stormwater and green infrastructure program, um, and they most recently have led a project that I've been involved with, the Great River Chicago initiative in partnership with the city of Chicago and the Friends of the Chicago River um, and they have produced our great rivers a future vision for Chicago's three rivers um, as I mentioned I'm the president and CEO of the Alliance for the Great Lakes we work every day to ensure a healthy Great Lakes for all people and wildlife forever um, we're headquartered here in Chicago with staff around the Great Lakes region and we engage tens of thousands of people every year in advocacy and volunteerism and education to ensure the realization of our vision and finally, uh, I'd like to thank uh, our beverage sponsor this evening, Bell's Brewery, and, and Larry Bell, who is actually here personally himself tonight. Thank you. Um, I admire Bells for three reasons. Uh, one is it's in Michigan, which is where I'm from. Uh, you know, two, it's one of uh, the lead, lead craft breweries in the United States, and three, Larry Bell is a true Great Lakes champion himself. So thanks, Larry. Um, okay. Now, let's get to the main event. Oh, before I do that, I've got to put in a plug for social media. There are Twitter hashtags and handle, handles, is, handles, yes, sorry. Uh, I'm clearly just a little bit uh, before, uh, before that time. On your, on your program tonight, please use them when you post this evening during the event, uh, and, and feel free to do that as much as you want. So first, I'm, uh, I'm going to welcome our interviewer this evening. Uh, Monica Eng is with WBEZ Chicago Public Radio. Uh, I actually met Monica last year where she uh, was on a panel uh, that I was uh, privileged to be on, where she described her experience investigating the presence of lead in drinking water in Chicago public schools, uh, a beat that she's continued uh, since then. Uh, at WBZ, uh, Monica covers Chicago history, health, and the environment. Before she came to WBZ, among other things, she was a reporter at the Chicago Tribune for 16 years, and there she covered food, health, sustainability, and culture, and was nominated for five James Beard Awards. Monica is a lifelong Chicagoan, and like my dad, is a lover of the now elusive fried smelt from the Great Lakes. Um, and probably a few of you are as well. Um, okay. So part of my job is talking with the press. Um, and typically those interactions are very quick hit. Hey, uh, city's water supply just got shut off. Or hey, an Asian carp was just found in the Calumet River. That one just happened a couple weeks ago, or a few months ago. Um, when Dan Egan ever, ever calls me and says, hey, Joel, I'm working on a story, um, I know that I'm going to need to reserve a couple of hours sometime over the next couple of weeks. One of them is to have an in-depth conversation with Dan. Uh, the other is to think really hard before I talk to him about what I'm going to say. Um, the reason I have to do that uh, is because Dan, since 2003, has been working with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel 
at the kind of journalism that we don't see enough of anymore. Deep journalism that goes beyond the reactions from people like me and really gets to the why things happen and who exactly is behind making those things happen. Um, I'm happy to spend as much time on the phone as Dan wants talking about that, and I'm thankful that that's how he's chosen to spend his career, and I'm glad he's here tonight. So uh, now the slightly more official bio. Dan Egan is a reporter at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and a senior water policy fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee's School of Freshwater Science, Sciences. He is a native of Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, but he took his first gig as an environment reporter in Ketchum, Idaho, because the other reporter didn't want it. Um, so whoever that was, thank him or her for me. Uh, when he returned from the high desert to our water-rich land, he got the Great Lakes uh, as a beat in 2003. Since since then, he has twice been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. He has won the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University Award, the John B. Oakes Award, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Kevley Science Journalism Award, and for that series uh, is very near and dear to my heart, and Harvard and Columbia University's J. Anthony Lucas Award. Dan's a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School, and he lives in Milwaukee with his wife and children. So please welcome our interviewer and our guest tonight. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Let's get this started. Dan, you were almost a reluctant author on this. You know, some people chase after a book contract their whole life, but that wasn't your story. How did this, how did this book get written? Well, as Joe mentioned in his very kind introduction, I've been covering the Great Lakes since 2003, and in 2011, I went out to New York on a fellowship with my wife and four young kids um, for a year, an academic year, at uh, Columbia University. And part of that program required, uh, or involved, taking a book writing seminar, and part of that seminar required putting together a book proposal. So I looked back at, at that point, almost 10 years worth of work, and every year I typically did one big series or package for the newspaper and as I looked at them they kind of stacked up like chapters so I put that together just trying to pass the class I, I really wasn't interested in writing <laughs> writing the, the book because I have a full-time job at the newspaper and I have a wife and four kids and I want to keep both of them or all of them <laughs> and and writing a book as, as I feared uh, was quite a time suck <laughs> and yet it happened, you know, someone got a whiff of your proposal and they're like, man, you got to write this. So. Yeah, yeah, it, the, the proposal made its way to, to an agent who coincidentally happened to be the agent for the book writing seminar, and, and I believe him because I met a, a third party who handed this proposal to that agent. He happened to be a Milwaukee native, his name is Barney Carpfinger, and... Carpfinger, uh, so it's faded. Yeah, perhaps, <laughs> Carp with a K. Uh, he, he got to he look at it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he got to look at it and and here's what was interesting. He he was a Milwaukee native, so he has some uh, uh, some Midwest sensibilities and some appreciation for what the Great Lakes are, but what he kept saying and after it went on to the publisher WW Norton, the editor there, th there was just this chorus of you're being too provincial, you're writing with an assumption that people know too much about these lakes. You've got to introduce them from 30,000 feet. And and I thought no sweat and it was a big sweat. It was actually really <laughs> really a challenge so I, I got back to the newspaper and it took it took over a year because because Barney's a very busy guy just tweaking the proposal and then I remember one Friday afternoon I was just kind of at my wits end like I don't know what else I can do with this and I sent it off to him and he just wanted a couple of minor changes and he writes back he's like that's what I was looking for uh, this baby he literally wrote this baby's ready to go and I you know it took a year just on the proposal I thought I'll hear from him in, a, in another year or two on Sunday night, two days later, he said, I'm meeting with a guy at Norton on Monday, and by Wednesday, we had a deal, and my fears were realized. Oh. I had to, <laughs> I, I thought, well, this is great, but now I have to write a book, and I took, tw I took 20 months off of work. To, wow. Not off of work. <laughs> I took 20 months away from the newspaper. Yeah. So in your book, you detail a lot of the challenges facing the Great Lakes, and yet it, it's also been described as cautiously optimistic. Where do you find hope in dealing with the challenges that the Great Lakes face right now? I get people do ask, you know, are, are, don't you get depressed covering this? And 
not, not at all. I mean, as long as the beaches are as spectacular as they still are, I take my kids down to the beach in Milwaukee. We live a few blocks away every chance I get. Um, there's, there's no reason to be overly distraught or distressed. There's still magnificent bodies of water. They've taken a lot of hits, as has the land. And, you know, and we're never going to bring the lakes back to what they were, just like we're never going to bring the, you know, Chicago back to what it was. And, and that's, that's just the reality. That doesn't mean that there aren't things we need to do. It's kind of, it was once described to me by a biologist uh, as like, you know, uh, you can be fatalistic about these things, but that, you can be fatalistic about your own life too. You know, you know you're going to die at some point, so why do a push-up or eat vegetables? <laughs> but, but there are good reasons to do that, uh, um, even uh, beyond extending, uh, extending your life. So um, uh, the optimism that I have or see in the lakes is that there is, I think, a growing consciousness. I mean, look, thank you all for coming out tonight. The rooms like this, people care about the lakes, and, and they have for a while, but there, there was a long while where it could be argued that people didn't care about the lakes. The problems facing them today are more complicated than when we had pipes and smokestacks spewing, you know, whatever the companies wanted. We, we have fi figured out how to plug or cap the pollution flow from those tubes. We, we haven't figured out how to stop another form of pollution, which I talk about in the book as biological pollution, and that's invasive species that have arguably done as much, or it's done, they've done more damage, I, I would say, because the lakes can heal from, from these traditional pollutions, but they, they have a hard time rebounding from, from this biological pollution. And the doors, in the book I organize it as a front door and a back door. The front door are the, the connections so, uh, primarily the St. Lawrence Seaway, linking the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Seaboard. And then the back door is right here in Chicago, uh, the, the artificial connection between uh, the Great Lakes Basin and the Mississippi River Basin. And they're both pathways for invasive species, and they're both still open pathways. Which invasive species are you most concerned about, and what are the biggest opportunities to slow their, their invasion? I, you know, that's a good question and a hard question because, you know, we probably don't know what we should be afraid of right now. I mean, nobody heard the word zebra mussel until, you know, the late 80s, early 90s. As a matter of fact, once uh, I, I read some account, they were debating some funding after the zebra mussels first arrived on, on research in, in Congress, and some congressman chimed in, why are we concerned about the mussels of zebras? <laughs> it was... Smart legislators. <laughs> but, but, you know, so the, the, the species that, that people are concerned about right now are Asian carp, and I think that's appropriate. Um, but what's interesting to me is that we've got 186, well, it's, it's a running number, I think it's 188 now, of non-native species, and there is a distinction between invasive and non-native, and it's, it's a fuzzy one. It's basically what, what we like collectively or, and what we don't. Um, but, but the lakes are full of, of non-native critters, some of which are are invasive, and arguably these Asian carp would be invasive. What I think is important about them, though, is that you know we have 188 non-native species. Now people care about 189. I, I think you know five or ten years ago, it really wasn't on people's radar, and these fish grabbed the public's attention. And I think it's because of their size; they're charismatic. You know, you they jump into your they boat. jump into your boat. Yeah, they can they can ruin the you know recreating on the lakes. They they threaten the fishery. Uh, and, and, and they're visible, and, and we you know, have a pretty good idea of where they are and, and where they're headed, and we have a pretty good opportunity to head it off, and, and I hope we take advantage of it. So I guess that way the question is which species am I most concerned about or worried about? I, I guess I'm, I'm worried about the carp. I'm, I'm worried that we won't stop them, and if we can't stop something that big and obvious and that confined, um, it doesn't it doesn't bode well for, for other things, things that we can't see, microbes and, and whatnot. So, uh, As someone who's done a lot of food writing, too, I asked you, well, and as someone who loves eating mussels, I said, well, can't we just eat all the zebra mussels? And, and you told me, you, I, you set I me straight on those. I don't think they make small enough forks or, yeah, or baguettes. To, they're super no, tiny. They're tiny. So. They're, yeah, you know, they're, they're fingernail sized. And, um, you know, there's protein in there. Uh, I don't think there's ever been a commercial, maybe uh, I'm probably wrong, but I don't know of any commercial application for uh, processing these things. They do, they're 
they're filter feeders, and you know there would there would clearly be an issue as far as or there may well be an issue as far as sucking the fact that they're containing stuff that you would not want to consume. Oh right, so they, they've got all the toxins in them, yeah. and they're the reason the the water is clear. And are they also the reason the water? Like when I was drinking some water before I came here, kind of has a weird funky smell in the summer. I don't know. I, that, that's beyond my expertise. Why, why <laughs> Chicago's water spell, smells? They, they like to blame Milwaukee, so uh, <laughs> well, yeah, for most of our problems, so, yeah. <laughs> inappropriately so. But uh, um, but they I, do. They make the water. They clear. do. They've they've made the water, you know, spectacularly blue, and it really is deceiving. And it, it's it's ironic. It's you know not the sign of a healthy lake. It's the sign of a lake getting the life sucked out of it, which is literally what the mussels have done. And they've literally taken, decimated, taken, you know, in, in springtime, taken plankton populations down to 10% of their pre-muscle invasion levels. And that's the bottom of the food chain. And if you take that out, everything above it suffers, smelt included. Which I've learned were invasive species, too. And, yeah. Invasive or, yeah, it depends on who you're asking. I know a lot of... They were serving them at Shaw's one time when I was here, and, and nobody was considering them invasive. That right. I, I like that kind of invasive species. And I remember, and maybe a lot of you do, as a kid, you know, going down to Lake Michigan at nighttime, and people had their nets, and they would bring them up in the springtime, and you just don't see that anymore. Uh, so given the invasive species and, and the problems that have occurred with our connections to other uh, bodies of water, was the St. Lawrence Seaway a mistake in the end? Aha, in the end. <laughs> um, if, if you left it as, was it a mistake or is it a mistake? That's a hard question. To, knowing what we know now, yeah, but I, it was a, and I'll, I'll explain why, but you know, at the time that it was built, and, and like so many of these things, it, they seemed like a good idea at the time, and I, I really try to, you know, look at, it, look at the issues through that lens in this book, because I'm sure we're doing things today that make a lot of sense that are going to leave our grandchildren and great-grandchildren scratching their heads, thinking, what in the heck were, were they thinking? But the problem with the Seaway is that they built it on the cheap. It opened in 1959 and, yeah. and they built the locks and the channels too small. They built the locks and the channels to match those of the Welland Canal, which is now known as part of the Seaway, but it's the, the portion that allows boats to bypass Niagara Falls. It's the heavy lift in the Seaway. And those, those uh, locks were finished in, in the early 1930s. So when it came time to build a Seaway, which was you know this dream that had been you know dreamt since since whites first arrived in, in the region, um, the, the idea was once and for all, let's build, uh, let's build a, a shipping channel that will make us a world-class serious group of cities, uh, port cities, like the Mediterranean, an American Mediterranean. But they didn't want to rebuild the Welland Canal at that point. It would have doubled the cost of the seaway. So they opened it in 1959 at uh, specs that really reflected the pre-World War II uh, world's fleet. And so it was, it's been said, I didn't, I didn't coin this phrase, but I like it. It was obsolete uh, the day it opened. Having said that, we, we do get traffic coming up the seaway from overseas, and it is valuable, um, and it does play a role in our economy. It's just not what the public expected. Great Lakes shipping is a huge, important business, but the overseas component of it is relatively small. It, not really, it is small. It's less than 5%. It's fewer than two ships a day coming in. And, and they're not bringing in Nikes and Sonys and you know flat screens, and Toyotas. It's it's low value bulk goods. It's primarily steel coming in and grain going out, mm. and and so we we didn't get the cargos we hoped for, but we got some that we weren't planning for, and they've made the biggest they've difference. Been invasive species they're the story in of the water. seaway, really, yeah. yeah. Uh, now, having spoken to you in the kitchen for a few minutes, I've noticed you're a super modest guy, and I think your modesty of, of what you know was reflected in the fact that these publishers wanted to know what you knew about the Great Lakes. I think when we cover stuff, we're like, well, doesn't everybody know this? Some people have compared your book to like someone like Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, in terms of bringing these, the awareness of these things to the forefront. Do you see yourself in, in, in that vein at all? No, I, I don't. I really don't. And, you know... <laughs> I'm writing about a specific geographic area. I'm writing about a very important natural resource. 
but I, I, I'm not, I, I, I never thought that I was writing something akin to Silent Spring, or people often mention Jane Jacobs for, for good reason, because the title of the book is Death right. and Life of the Great Lakes. And that was your book. publisher, not you. Yeah, that was, my, my title, my working title in my head was... Um, stuff I, think, I know about the Great Lakes. <laughs> all the stuff I've learned in the last <laughs> 10 years that my wife's sick of hearing me talk about. No, it was, it was uh, provocatively, perhaps too provocatively, uh, called Liquid Desert. And those weren't my words. Those were the words that the, uh, the last commercial fisherman in Milwaukee who pulled out in 2011 used to describe the lake. He was a third, well, uh, technically a fourth generation fisherman. Um, and you know, his whole family, uh, they were all fishermen. They were culturally tied to the lakes. They were, you know, they were as great lakeish, if that's a word, as you can get. And by the end, he couldn't even afford to pay for his fuel to get out on the lake. And he has a uh, fishing license uh, up in Canada, or up in Alaska, and he can catch more fish by the pound in a day than he was catching all year long on Lake Michigan. And I remember, um, this didn't make it into the book, but it made it into one of the series that I did. I was sitting in his living room up on the family homestead. Uh, his, his father was born in Door County near, near Death Store. And we had gone Death out. Death Store Brewery? I don't know if it's near oh, that brewery. No, no, that's a like distillery. distillery. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, a but we place? actually we went out on the water. It was in May, and I thought I, I thought we were we were going down. And these guys, it was just a normal day. And he saw how pale I was. I mean, because it was it was really rocking and rolling. And he says to me, the commercial fisherman, "You want to be out here when it's rocking and rolling." And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Otherwise, you're on the bottom." <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after that day on the water, we went back to the family, the old family cabin, which there was now a bed and breakfast part of the bed and breakfast complex. And he was talking to his mom and dad about his plans to leave uh, for Alaska with his kids. So these grandparents were losing their grandkids, and his mom was crying. And he said, I've told you this over and over. I'm not leaving the lake. The lake left me. And I was wow. like, whoa. So. so what are the chances that the Great Lakes could once again become this wonderful source of fresh fish for people in the next 50 years even? Well, it depends on what we do now. I mean, these doors, these front and back doors are still open. If we can close that, I think, you know, and just give the lakes a breather and give nature a chance to kind of assert herself or itself, um, there's, there's a good chance that we will achieve a new balance. It's happening now on Lake Huron. You know, they, they lost their salmon fishery. And the salmon are an introduced species. They're one of these 188 non-native species, and few people would consider them invasive. But biologically, you could make the argument that they no more belong in the lakes than big head or silver carp. Not entirely, actually, because they were planted for a specific reason, and that was to eat alewives. I'm going somewhere here. Right. So I trust you. So, so the alewives, an invasive species that wasn't brought in by uh, overseas freighters but swam up the shipping channels, um, they were basically a cockroach of a fish. And I'm sure many people in this room remember the dark days of the late 1960s uh, when the beaches were really, you know, Just scary. The worst place to be. Yeah. And and then. People realized that they could turn these fish into fuel for something, and it was fuel for the salmon fishery. And so we built a multi-billion dollar recreational fishery, largely on the back of this invasive species. And so we came to look at the alewives completely differently. Um, that was the top of the food chain, a top of the food chain problem. What we have going on now is a bottom of the food chain problem, and that's largely tied to these mussels. But like these alewives that were once cockroaches of the sea, there is another invasive fish in the Great Lakes, the round goby, which came from the same place as the invasive mussels, the Caspian Sea, Black Sea basins. Wow. Came came the same way in, in the ballast, the ship steadying ballast tanks of overseas freighters coming up the St. Lawrence Seaway, and they are going to town on the mussels. Now, anything that can figure out 
a how to eat a goby is doing all right and is going to do all right. Salmon, unfortunately, aren't that species. They're built to chase schooling fish. So as the alewives disappear because they're not getting the food that they normally would because of the mussels, gobies are doing great. And native species, and this is like a case study going on on Lake Huron, are really starting to thrive. You've got like record walleye populations. You've got uh, lake trout reproducing on their own at levels that you know we haven't seen in almost 100 years. And they're getting to the point where they may not need to use breeding stocking programs to maintain a native lake trout population. You've got native whitefish going great guns. They're all eating gobies, and whitefish aren't even piscivores. They're not, they're not nature built to eat fish. Huh. But if it's death or a goby, They'll take a goby and, and you know. That's what I say. <laughs> commercial fishermen. <laughs> it's going to be a t-shirt. Um, commercial fishermen tell these stories of, of catching whitefish in their nets, and their jaws are ripped open because their, their mouths aren't built to get around something. And the gobies aren't that big. They're like thumb-sized. But the, the whitefish are typically bottom grubbers, and, and their, their preferred diet has now disappeared because of the, the quagga and zebra mussels. So uh, they're going after gobies. And, and actually, they're, they're learning how to eat mussels uh, to some degree as well. So, so people say, is that evolution, or is that just, as the biologists say, species plasticity? Uh, I don't know, but it's neat to see. And there are signs that this is happening on Lake Michigan as well. And it's not all good. It's not good for the, the, the um, Charter fishermen and the people who enjoy fishing for salmon, but but lake trout are doing well on Lake Michigan. I was out here uh, two weeks ago on Lake Michigan with a commercial with a uh, a charter boat guy, and he said, you know, they got all the lakers they can handle now, which is really cool because they are the natives. They are the native predator. They're the wolf in our aquatic ecosystem. Do you eat Great Lakes fish, and if so, how often and what kind? That's a good question. Uh, yeah, Lake Superior lake trout. And I think it's $7.99 a pound uh, compared to 24 or whatever you want to pay for some kind of an ocean filet. And it's delectable. And I, I would say I eat it uh, twice a month easily. And I like whitefish when I go out. Yeah. So, yeah. Those are pretty safe species to eat, you know. Yeah, you know, I actually don't know what the, you know, I, I'm, the, I don't want to eat m much of anything more than twice a month, so <laughs> so I figure I'm I'm playing Pretty it conservative safe. there. Yeah. I, and I'll tweet out the uh, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources recommendations on how often you should eat uh, Lake Michigan fish. So I think a lot of people when they when they look at all sorts of environmental issues say, okay, well, what can I do? What can just one guy gal do? In your eyes, what is the most effective thing someone can do if they care about the health of the Great Lakes. Well, come to things like this. Right. Okay. Can maybe buy a book about the Great Lakes. <laughs> <laughs> a few for uh, your family too. No, but uh, speaking of my family, this is this is where I think it's it's you know kind of deceptively simple. But you know you, you get inf you get informed, you make your voice heard, you join groups, you you grow that voice. That's that's one obvious tack. But another one is to make sure that your kids have a relationship with the lake, whether that's through fishing or swimming. I mean, it's hard to to get a kid out on a great lake uh, because of the, the gear that's needed. But it's not hard to take them to the beach. Right. And you know, I think that's one of the problems that the lake suffered in the 1960s is you had a lot of people turn their back. Um, literally turn their back on the water, and and then you lose a whole generational constituency. Mm -hmm. And and so if you have kids or family members or just yourself, just make sure that you swim and appreciate the lake and and that i think will foment you know action at some level but i'm a journalist too i'm not here to write a prescription right yeah. uh but swimming that's good i mean and now in in october we can swim you can go out and swim today and it's warm enough which brings its own issues and i've got one question last question uh that deals with that but then we'll be taking questions from the audience with i just did the story about what's the most likely disaster natural disaster to hit chicago and then we got all these follow-up questions and one of them included what can we expect about rising or lowering levels on lake michigan in, in terms of climate change in the future. Yeah, and that is a good question, and there is no, there's not a, an easy or necessarily uh, optimistic answer. Um, 
we've been keeping water level records on Lake Michigan since the mid 1800s, and I, th I can't remember the number. I think it's uh, Lake Michigan's long term average is like the surface is 578.5 feet above sea. More or less. More or less. It's never there, really. It's kind of a mythical average because we're always on our way below it or above it, and it's just, you know, the, where we right down the middle. And, and since we've been keeping these records, th these undulations have never gone more than three feet above this, this red line average, we'll call it the red line, or three feet below. Well, things are changing now, particularly with ice cover on the lakes, and that's a big factor in lake levels because if you don't have a white winter cap to bounce all this solar radiation back up into the sky, the lakes, the lakes start heating up, you know, as early as, as March, and, and that gives them a running start to hitting, you know, their peak temperature in September or so, and, and then when the cold winds of November come blowing in, that temperature differential creates massive amounts of evaporation, and that's why we went 14 years until two, two or three years ago below our long-term average, which was a record period to be below the long-term average. And and then we got what nobody was expecting, uh, the um, polar vortex, two winters of, of severe ice, and the lake shot up faster beyond their long-term average than they have at any point. And now people are saying, well, what's next? And what the, what's kind of um, concerning is that there is no reason that these lakes have to be shackled to this three feet high or three feet low. I've been talking to some scientists up at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee who say it could, it could easily go four to five feet above and below. So now you have an eight to ten foot swing between highs and lows. And I'm sure some people here remember Lakeshore Drive in October or fall of 1986 when you know it was underwater when some fall storms blew in. Add two feet, add three feet to that, and it's a problem. And and then on the other end, take take two or three feet below the, um, the long-term lows, and drinking water intake is an issue, navigation's obviously an issue, property values. We, we, we need the lakes to stay within this historic bracket, but they, they're, they're not worried about us. We should, and I don't know what the answer is. You know, it's, there's been talk about engineering some kind of fix on the St. Clair River, which maybe at some point could be feasible, but it would take understanding long-term weather patterns to a specificity that we don't have right now, because you could be closing a gate on the outflow to the lakes when you should be opening it and exacerbating problems four months down the road. So, you know, hopefully hopefully we get lucky, but that's really not a That's about as good strategy. as we can get. Hopefully we get lucky. Yeah, I mean, I guess with, with all of the effects of climate change, it's just going to be bigger extremes, bigger swings than we've seen before. Yeah. So, Joel, are you going to facilitate the questions for us? Sure, sure. Um, so, everybody, we're going to move to audience questions. First of all, thank you, uh, Dan and Monica, for that conversation. Uh, and, and let's keep it up. Uh, we're going to have at least one roving mic through the room. And I invite uh, anybody to ask um, uh, any questions you'd like to, well, not any questions, preferably <laughs> related to the Great Lakes and, uh, and our, our guest's area of expertise. Um, so just raise your hand, and we'll get a mic to you. We have one in the front row. And I would ask, because we're recording, please be sure to speak into the mic when you're asking your question. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, the sort of political landscape around fixing, you know, making some necessary fixes to the Great Lakes ecosystem? Yeah, well, you know, when the new administration came in, one of the first things that they did was, um, was propose eliminating the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which has been going on since 2010, I believe. It was started under the Obama administration, and it was like a Everglades, it is like an Everglades style ecosystem restoration plan that has sent hundreds of millions of dollars, or somewhere around 400 million at its peak, uh, a little less than that now, annually into all sorts of, of projects for the Great Lakes, whether it's you know, reclaiming some some of the, the, the more polluted harbors like in Waukegan, and there's plenty of them up in Wisconsin as well, or researching how to understand the flow of energy through the lakes through invasive species and how we may better control them, to restoring wetlands, just things that the lakes, you know, have needed for a long time. And 
and the current administration didn't see a need for it, and I think they were surprised, I wasn't, and I don't think most people who follow these issues were, that the states, whether, you know, led by Republicans or Democrats, didn't want to go along with that because, you know, clean water and healthy lakes, it's not a Republican-Democrat issue at all. And also, when you look at the political makeup of the eight Great Lakes states, there's a lot of purple states in there with Wisconsin and Ohio and Pennsylvania, and so Michigan. So, so it's been said um, that you know the key to the voters' hearts in this region is through the Great Lakes, and I think that that pathway is the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and I think you know it's going to be funded. So, so that's encouraging. But on the other side, or beyond that, you know, there was there was talk about the EPA the regional EPA, Region 5, is it, uh, being eliminated. That's based here in Chicago, and that's, you know, a big eye on the lakes that they were thinking of moving, I think, to Missouri or Kansas or something. And, you know, to, to what end? We, we've seen, I mean, it, if we haven't learned from from the past abuses, back it took it took that river, the Cuyahoga River, in 1969, to really wake people up to say enough is enough. We've got to stop dumping in in these waters, and we got out of that the Clean Water Act. And I don't know who in anywhere would say, boy, that was a dumb idea, you know. And it's not perfect, you know. These 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 regulations can can you know sometimes be interpreted as being applied unfairly, and you're always going to find examples of that. But, you know, the river, the Cuyahoga River, is no longer a punchline. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a source of pride in, Cle in Cleveland. And, and so, you know, the previous generation recognized the problems of the earlier generations, and they, they stepped forward and committed to doing something about that. And I think with the Great Lakes Restoration initi Initiative, we're moving in that direction as well. But, you know, there's a threat. We could go backwards. I don't think that the public would tolerate it, but you can do some some damage pretty quickly before people realize it. So, yeah. Sure, Nelson. You know, Maria had her oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Uh, as the earth gets hotter, as droughts become more prevalent, do you think actual wars will be fought over these lakes? I don't know. But, you know, we. we <laughs> It was in 2008 we passed the Great Lakes Compact, which prohibits large-scale diversions out of the Great Lakes. Um, and that, that was a remarkable achievement because it showed uh, we were speaking with one, one common voice for the region and for the lakes. And, and it's, it's so far working. I mean, there are, there are exceptions. They were written, written into the compact. They were basically, um, you know, they, if, up in Milwaukee. There's a Milwaukee suburb that is about to get Lake Michigan water outside of the Great Lakes Basin, but it has to send its treated wastewater back in. So they're basically requiring anybody who takes Great Lakes water to, to literally engineer themselves into the basin. And that's great. But the pressure to, to you know, siphon away Great Lakes water isn't going to go away. And what Congress gives us, which was the compact, Congress can take away. And I used to think it was folly, not long ago at all, <coughs> that we could appreciably lower the lakes with some kind of massive diversion. And then I started doing some research on oil pipelines um, coming from Western Canada into the Great Lakes. And up at the western end of Lake Superior, at the city of Superior, we've got about 2.6 million barrels of Canadian oil coming into Wisconsin on its way towards Chicago and, and some through the UP underneath the Mackinac Bridge on its way to Ontario. Uh, and that's a whole other story. Um, so that's that's a river's worth of oil. And this isn't, this stuff is like, it comes out of the, it's the tar sands oil and a lot of it is. And it, it's, it comes out hard as a hockey puck and it has to be melted and diluted and even even in that state, it's like a glue that they're pushing through uh, all the way from Western Canada into the Great Lakes. And I pushed some numbers around earlier this year, and, and 2.6 million barrels per day is the equivalent of the Milwaukee River, which is not an insignificant river in, in late summer, in a drier late summer. But it, it, you know, there's been times when the Milwaukee River has been substantially less. So we're moving rivers of oil, you know, into the lakes. There's no 
reason we couldn't move, you know, water out uh, in a similar fashion, and we do to a degree on the Chicago Sanitarian Ship Canal. Uh, so far, you haven't uh, had the opportunity to speak about uh, industrial waste in the Great Lakes Basin. Could you, you know, talk about some of the more significant industrial waste issues? Yeah, you know, I really focused the book on post-Cuyahoga River. And what happened, we got the Clean Water Act, but unfortunately, for whatever reason, the Environmental Protection Agency decided to exempt ballast water discharges from, from enforcement of, under the Clean Water Act. They gave it a pass, and we've suffered immensely from that. Prior to that, we suffered immensely from, from industrial pollution, but we've gone a long way from, from the early 1970s. I know it was a big news here about seven or eight years ago that BP was given a permit by the state of Indiana to discharge more suspended solids, or sludge, as some people called it, into the lakes, and people went, went nuts over it. And that's, it's, it's good that people are keeping an eye on the lake, but the, the load that they were talking about putting into the, into the water was really, it was ammonia, or uh, nitrogen was a big, a big component of that, if I remember correctly. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't an, uh, an appreciable uh, increase compared to like adding a whole new, as we're doing in Milwaukee, we're, we're engineering a whole city into the, into the basin, and with that comes its treated wastewater, which is going to mean more pollution going into the lakes. But that's, those are, the Clean Water Act was designed to just ratchet down the amount of pollution that we're putting in not just the lakes, but in waters across the country, and it's working. And I don't see that as the big threat. I really don't, unless we lose Region 5 uh, from the EPA and we, you know, I don't know what the, fr the, the equation was, but it's like we want to, for every new regulation, we're going to kill two regulations or something like that. We can go backwards, with the, you know, we could, and, and then we've got, we've got problems. But we should feel good about how far we've come. We've got a long way to go, but look at the, you know, people swimming on a hot summer day here. That's, you know, it's, it's really cool. Questions? Over here in the front. So in the book, you refer to the salmon as kind of a fisheries upgrade um, in the 60s. And in the state of the lakes, they're, they're starting to get a little tenuous again. Are we overdue for another fisheries upgrade? I guess, you know, I don't know if I referred to it as an upgrade. I think some people, were, they, they thought they were giving the lakes an upgrade, and they were, you know, economically. It brought people down to the lakes to fish, private people, not just commercial uh, fishermen at, at numbers that had never before happened, and that brought a lot of people you know, out to care about the lake, so it did create a constituency. But when you, we are, I think we are headed for some kind of a, of a, of a new regime, and it looks like that new regime involves, as I mentioned earlier, pretty much any species that can make a meal out of a goby, and that's, it's not exclusively native species, it's also brown trout, um, but, but yeah, the salmon are, the salmon are having a rough time. Uh, two years ago, or yeah, I think it was two years ago, I went out every uh, fall, the U.S., the United States Geological Survey does a, a survey, appropriately, of, of Lake Michigan. They've been doing this since 1973, where they, they, they drag nets across the bottom of the lake at very specific places at the very same time of the year, and, and they keep track of that, and they got their baseline in 1973, and through computer programming and modeling and stuff I don't understand, they basically keep an eye on the, on the lake's gas gauge, which is the amount of, of prey fish, a fish that, you know, the predators can eat. And, and we are at, like, record, every year it's a record low for alewives. And, and so uh, if there's no alewives, there's going to be no or very few salmon. So yeah, I mean, we may be headed, and some people would see it as an upgrade, and I can see that point. Um, I like the idea of, a, of a, a lake that's in a natural balance, but I also appreciate the role that salmon have played economically and culturally over the last 50 years, so yeah. Will we lose that constituency? 
That's a good question. You know, you don't, there, there's a lot of charter boat captains who say that they can't bring in, you know, they can't get customers to pay, you know, a few hundred dollars for an afternoon to go out fishing for lake trout. And the reason is lake trout are considered not as much fun to catch because they don't put up a fight like, like the salmon do. And um, yeah, that's a good question. But you look at what's going on in Saginaw Bay over on Lake Huron and the, the walleye fishery there is just incredible. And you know, everybody wants the lake of their fondest memory and we don't, we're not always entitled to that and that may be where we're headed here. And it, it is, I, I recognize that it's, it, it's a scary rough time for, for salmon charter guys. Got a question over here, then we can take one or two more, and then we'll move on. This is kind of a small, concrete question, but has positive implications. Um, do the uh, the whitefish and the trout that eat gobies, like in Lake Superior, do they taste as good as the old ones? <laughs> the fishermen will say absolutely uh, yes. I, I'm not so sure. You know, I can't. <laughs> well, I I, I eat whitefish for some reason. I can't. I eat it at restaurants. I, I just I always overcook it when I try to cook it at home. But um, that's, a, that's only natural to ask that question. If you're eating something different, you're probably going to taste different. And um, you know, the, the commercial fishermen say that they, they, they're just as good as they've always been, and they're, they're selling well, the Wisconsin fish. But the Lake Superior, Lake Superior wasn't hit by the mussel invasion to the extent that the other lakes were, primarily because it doesn't have the calcium to support mussel shells. So it's a good question. I, I it still it still tastes good. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna go over here to the back oh. corner and uh, see how we do on time. <laughs> Hi, uh, uh, could you comment on uh, the agricultural and urban runoff problem and how you know the challenges yeah, in sure. terms of uh, Lake Erie and and how that compares? Yeah, you know, like like the dark days of the Cuyahoga River burning. The, there were massive dead zones in Lake Erie specifically uh, due to algae um, outbreaks. And, and we, we solved that, you know, science solved that, and then we got the political will to, to implement the plan that the scientists put together, and it was to dramatically reduce the load of phosphorus going into the western, or going into Lake Erie overall. And, and that was done through a variety of ways, including spending, I believe it was billions of dollars, with a B, uh, on, on sewer treatment upgrades, and also banning or severely restricting phosphorus in laundry detergent. So, you know, we took a hit in the white shirt department, <laughs> but we got a we got a, a less green lake out of it, and and just like back in the 1970s, we were, the lake is suffering again from a phosphorus overdose. It's not that there's more phosphorus going into the lake right now than there was prior to these outbreaks over the last 10 years. It's that the form of it, it's this dissolved reactive phosphorus, which is basically store-bought fertilizer coming off the croplands, uh, and it, so it's 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 an interesting problem because it's a confluence of a few things. It's, it's this fertilizer washing off, so it's the form of fertilizer. It's increased springtime rains, which are documented on the western end of Lake Erie. And so if you get these rains, a pulse of water, before the crop can crops can start soaking up the fertilizer, it goes into the lake. And then once it gets into the lake, Back in the 60s, if you'd have an algae outbreak, it could be an assemblage of a whole bunch of different types of algae. Now it's primarily uh, microcystis, this uh, toxic algae. And the reason for that brings us back to where we started, and that is uh, mussels. And <laughs> the mussels are brainless, but they're smart enough to eat everything in the water but this toxic algae. You can see it out on the internet. Uh, they're in a, a mussel in an aquarium sucking all the flecks out of a water and then it just spits something back. Well, that something is, is this toxic algae. So when you get an explosion of algae now, it's more likely to be this toxic stuff. And that's what knocked out the drinking water for a half a million people in Toledo a few years ago. Does the Clean Water Act give us a false sense of security? Are we keeping up with the chemical industry? Are they coming up with new chemicals that are not included in the act? I don't have a good answer for that. This, um, I, I, I will say there are emerging issues such as the microbeads, the plastics. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I can't give you a good answer. My wife is actually an environmental regulator for the Wisconsin DNR, and I can talk to her and maybe get back to you. <laughs> 
got a last question up here. Can we bring the mic up? Over here. Oh, right here. <laughs> The uh, Army Corps had a recent study a month or two ago, and I know it's fairly new. Do you have an idea of your position and what positions we should be taking on that? Well, again, I'm a reporter, so uh, and I actually I've been I've been my head's been down in, in in pipelines for for the past few months. So we've had other other people at my newspaper covering this issue, but I think uh, you know it seems like a good intermediate step to stop this immediate threat of a carp invasion of the lakes. I know in the past when it's been uh, explored whether to permanently separate the two basins, the the navigation industry has complained loudly and bitterly that the economic consequences would be devastating. The, the numbers suggest that it's not the, the, industry, the amount of traffic that would be affected at this particular point where these basins would be separated isn't that big in the scheme of things as far as what's moving through Chicago. And there's actually opportunities to create transport systems, intermodal transport systems, so you can get more traffic on the canals without having this threat. And the Brandon uh, Road lock and dam is, they're basically wanting to use this, this navigation lock as a, as a kill zone. And I think the barge industry sees another you know potential headache and, and they're resisting it. And I know the state of Illinois, which isn't really all that flush with cash right now is concerned about what it's going to cost the state. I think it, it's it's questionable as to how much exactly it's going to cost the state. It may not be as much as some of the politicians are saying. So, you know, the, the barge industry's long had a problem with even the electric barrier on the canal, and I can see their point because a lot of these guys are moving petrochemicals and other explosive things, and it's been documented that, you know, arcs can, can fly between these barges, and if you catch a spark on the wrong barge, you know, you've got, you've got a bad situation. That being said, it's, it's, it's called the Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. It was built to do a primary thing, and, and that wasn't to move barges. So it's not, it's not their river. It's everybody's. That's a, uh, a great place to end. Um, I, we're going to uh, have a couple more speakers uh, briefly tonight, but I just want to say thank you to Monica and WBZ and Dan and the Milwaukee Journal Center. <laughs> Yeah, please, please have a seat. Uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shuffle off, uh, and I'll introduce our next speaker who's uh, going to speak to you from the Metropolitan Planning Council. But before I do that, I want to say thank you to Sarah uh, Cardona at MPC, and also to Annalisa Castle on the Alliance for the Great Lakes staff. Um, Sarah was the primary planner for this event and made all this happen. Thank you, and Annalisa from our end. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks so much, Joel. No, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to partner with you on an event. I think this is our first event that we're doing together, although we work a lot in, as you mentioned, Great River Chicago and in invasive species, carp, Dan, we're working towards it. Um, but um, really happy to be partnering with you on this. So I'm Sarah Cardona with MPC, and I just wanted to thank everybody for being here tonight. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot more about the natural and the human forces that are at play really shaping the Great Lakes. And it's, it's I, I'm going to look at them in a whole new light uh, after this event tonight. And I hope you will too, because I know we all want to work together to really ensure that these Great Lakes and really all our region's water resources can endure for all Chicagoans today, but for the next generation to come. And so before um, we get back to some mingling and book signing, I just wanted to mention uh, two things that MPC works on to really create a more equitable, sustainable, and prosperous uh, Greater Chicago region. One, you've already heard of Great River Chicago. Please check us out on that. Um, creating inviting productive and living rivers for all of us to benefit from and to connect communities to those natural assets and to one another. And also our stormwater work, as you've heard, um, we're working with communities to help them better manage the negative impacts of stormwater, um, such as urban flooding and water quality issues that we know will only worsen with climate change. So check more out at our website, metroplanning.org, and also check out what the Alliance for the Great Lakes is doing at their website, greatlakes.org as well. So um, we'd like to welcome my colleague Janet Myers up to say a few final words. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, 
I just wanted to wrap it up on behalf of MPC. Our president, Mary Sue Barrett, unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. She's in Stockholm this week with the Brookings Institute. She's presenting on um, Chicago's region-wide inclusion and equity strategy. So she sends her best regards and her thanks to everyone. Um, wanted to extend my gratitude, our gratitude again, to Dan and Monica for including us in that wonderful conversation. And Dan, thank you for sharing that book for us. Um, thank you to our partner and our co-host, Joel and the Alliance. It was really fun planning this with you. Um, special thanks to Larry, um, Larry Bell and Bell's Brewing for bringing your wonderful beer. Um, and thank you to Can TV for recording tonight. Um, as Sarah said, we don't usually do these think and drink events with other nonprofits. We usually do them on our own. So it was really fun for us tonight to see lots of old friends and meet new ones um, from a, a wide range of backgrounds and experiences and interests. You know, there's folks from nonprofit and business and government and higher ed and more. Um, but there's clear that we all, it's clear that we all have one thing in common. And, you know, we're all passionate and we all care deeply about making this region a better place to live, work, and play. Um, and that's clear because, as Dan said earlier, you all showed up tonight. And showing up makes a difference. So whether it's volunteerism or philanthropy or um, activism, civic engagement makes a difference now more than ever. So as we look toward the future of our region and our Great Lakes with hope and promise, we thank you and we ask you to keep showing up. Uh, bar is still open. There's more snacks back there. So thank you again. Enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you.